good morning, Werribee Baptist Church, both in the room and online. We are glad you are here. I am Pastor Deanna, part of the preaching team here, and I do a few other things around the place, but we are glad that you are here with us. If it's your first time or the first time in a long time, I've met a few people this morning that have been here just, this is their third visit. We are just so thrilled that you have chosen to come and worship with us today. Welcome. Welcome. You know what? I, uh, this will be the last time I'm speaking to you in this way. I may, may host in the next couple weeks, but I am getting ready to go on a trip to see my family that's been postponed for quite a few years, thanks to COVID. Um, and I am so excited. My family lives in Florida. Everybody thinks of Florida as the uh, vacation capital, and it is. My family lives 30 minutes from Walt Disney World, the big one. Yeah, and there's other uh, world, uh, world-renowned theme parks in the area as well. But you know what? I'm not going to those. I'm going to go see my family, maybe sneak over to the beach. Florida has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world without the sharks and the things that will kill you like they will here. <laughs> and the water's a little warmer. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. But, you know, um, I don't know if you noticed the church news. That was Simon. Simon is, I call Simon affectionately the drover because he keeps us all in line. He is so good and we have missed him. It's taken six people to fill his shoes while he's away. And uh, we appreciate you volunteers that have stepped into that gap. So Simon, did you see how tired Simon looked? (laughs) That is not normal Simon. I I told Simon, I said, wow, Simon needed this holiday. But as I followed his and Beck's journey and Karen's journey and the girls on social media, they put up some amazing pictures. And you see them just really ex- experiencing everything possible in Europe where they're at and they're touring. And, you know, I've loved watching it because Stan and I are what I call drive-by tourists, okay? Now, if you don't know what I mean by that, we lived in Pennsylvania for two years. That was two hours outside of New York City. Now, I'm sure that somebody in the room, that is your dream to go to New York City. Well, Stan and I would drive over for the weekend. We'd drive through the city. He drove through once, I think. And we're like, uh, yeah, that's the Empire State Building outside of the car window. And we'd drive by, and we might get out of the car on the New Jersey side to see the Statue of Liberty because, well, you know, you have to see it, but that's our extent of tourism. I was in Turkey a couple of years ago for work and at a conference, at the end of the conference, there was a group of people, uh, the conference was on the uh, shores of the Red Sea, I think, I'm not uh, too sure, but they were gonna go on this Bible tour after the conference and anybody could go and I'm like, nah, nah, that's not my thing. However, if anybody had said, hey, you wanna go check out the local grocery store, I'd be like, yes, I'm in. Now, I know that sounds silly. My husband hates that because I drag him to every grocery store in every country we've ever visited because I'm just curious. I want to know what they eat and what they buy and what their daily life looks like. In fact, when he visited Kenya for work a few, quite a few years ago, I said, Stan, please, 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 please go visit the grocery store and take some photographs for me, okay? Stan tried to do that for, he's such a good husband. Yes, (laughs) I gave you credit, honey. Until an armed security guard came up to him and wanted to know what he thought he was doing taking pictures inside this grocery store and made him delete everyone so I never got to see them. (laughs) Until I went to Kenya myself. But that's another thing. But that were this drive-by tourists. Unlike Simon and Beck, as you can see here, they are just living the life. That's making pizza in Rome, okay? And and seeing some of the great museums of the world over in Europe. I love that. Um, And you're probably wondering, what does any of this have to do with living faith lessons from the book of James? And if you stick with me, I'll tell you. We are up to the third third sermon in this series. And, you know, a few weeks ago, Pastor Stan talked to us about lessons about trials in our life and how the purpose that God has for pain to help mature our faith. And then last week, Pastor Justin talked about light hogs, those things that steal the light or try to hog the light, and that we have to stare down temptation to have that living faith. Well, today we're going to talk about practice, how practice makes perfect. We're going to close out the first um, chapter in the book of James. So to have living faith, we've got to remember that practice makes perfect. Now, if you were part of a sports team or part of... um, 
<laughs> my mind just went blank. Music, music, music. Um, the thing that I didn't practice was my piano. So people ask me, do you play an instrument? I say, uh, kind of, sort of. If I practice, I pray, play really well. But practice makes perfect. But we're not talking about perfection, being a perfect pianist, because I'm a perfectionist. Practice doesn't, our perfectionism doesn't make perfect, but we're talking about practice making mature. We want our faith to mature, and we're gonna look at some cue, clues to that in James today. So if you have a Bible, if you remember these things, it's called a book, the Bible, it's real, you can hand it, I like them still, I have a, a collection. It, you can turn to James 1, 19 through 27 to follow along, I'll have the, the uh, scriptures on the screen for you, or you can follow on your devices, but we'd, I would encourage you to follow along in the book. This letter from James, James was one of the disciples, he was a half-brother of Jesus, and, you know, I, I try to figure out how to word that, but James was a half-brother of Jesus because Mary, we know Jesus was born of a virgin, the Holy Spirit, um, did a miraculous work, and therefore, Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father. So uh, these brothers, though, grew up in the same home, and he was writing to first this letter to first century Jewish Christians who were scattered abroad. It is known as one of the earliest epistles. The word epistle just means letter. And it predates all of the Pauline writings or the Apostle Paul, all of his writings, this predates that, as well as most of the Gospels, the dates we have for the Gospels. Um, it, we, the scholars would, when they look at all of the, the content and the, um, the timing of the documents and stuff, Estimate that it was written probably in 49 A.D., okay? 49 A.D. Do you realize that, that was, uh, and that was before the Jerusalem Council, and if you don't know what the Jerusalem Council was, that's okay. In a nutshell, the church was arguing about some things, that early church, and the Jerusalem Council met to say this is how, these are the bare minimums for what following Christ should look like. And they settled that. Um, in the early days of the church. So this was written just prior to that or right around that time. You know, that was 1,974 years ago. That's a long time, isn't it? And yet it is still so incredibly relevant for today. It is amazing. God's word is just amazing. So we're gonna pick up in chapter one, verses 19, and it says this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Now, I wanna, I've highlighted some words there for you. Must, it is an imperative. It is a must, these things that he's telling us. Quick to listen and slow to speak. There's a prioritization, um, it, and it applies to all. You must all. It, it is not excluding anybody, so you're not off the hook. And it, we see that this listening takes priority over speaking, and that we are to control our emotional response in those interactions. Now, I do a fair bit of counseling. I've trained as a counselor. And if you were to come to me with some of your uh, concerns in your life, your challenges, and I were to tell you I know the secret to improving every single relationship in your life. So that's work and home and family and friends and kids and you name it, neighbors. I, I know the, the solution to fix or improve those relationships. Would you be interested? Yeah. yeah? Yeah? It's pretty easy. I'll give you my secret. The secret every good counselor knows is the importance of being a good listener. Okay? Because when we don't listen, uh, it breaks down communication, and communication breakdowns are often the key to uh, disruption and disunity and stuff in relationships. So, you know, it's very easy to pick this out when um, you start working with somebody. But the breakdowns in communication are often to blame. And then active listening, which counselors are taught, uh, they look at things like body language or word choice. Words are very powerful and important. Uh, emotional displays, tone of voice, even what's not being said, we listen for that. And we listen intently, we tune in. None of this, I'm on my device while you're talking to me stuff, okay? We tune in and we give that speaker full attention. Do you know why? One, we need to hear and unpack, let them unpack what they're struggling with, but also because it gives them value. Sometimes people come very broken and they need that sense of feeling valued. 
Now, James knew this. I don't know if he studied counseling or not, but he said we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. This does not come to us naturally. Did you know that? We do just the opposite. We tend to be a little bit more self-focused than others focused. And we may form opinions before the person's ever even opened their mouth. We'll size them up head to toe and we make an opinion on what we think we know. And we don't even begin to listen sometimes. We formulate a response before the other person, if we do give them a chance to speak, we formulate our response before they even finish so we don't necessarily hear them fully. Our emotions sometimes get triggered because they'll say just something that just sets us off and we'll react inside of ourselves and we'll have a wrong, we'll sometimes make wrong assumptions or draw wrong conclusions before we've even heard the whole of the matter rather than ask for clarity and, and start and say, I'm, I'm sorry, you just said this, is this what you meant? Because sometimes we misunderstand or, or what they're trying to say, we interpret the wrong way so we don't ask for that clarity and then we stop listening or cut them off and we interrupt or we speak over each other. And then our anger can boil up inside of us when these things happen and we go on the defense and we're getting ready to let them have it with our positions and our opinions on what they're saying that we disagree with. And you know, when we try to be helpful and positive, sometimes we jump into even something that's more frustrating is the fix it mode because we think that, you know, we just listen long enough so we can hear the problem and we think, oh, I can fix that. And we shut things down. And you know why that's a little bit self-serving sometimes is, you know, when I was studying counseling, my counselor trainer said to me, Deanna, you're not here to fix the problem. You are here to drain the pus. Isn't that gross? It was a guy <laughs> that said that. I like to say drain the pain. But, um, it's, uh, but that's the reality. It's just that, you know, I... I, have you ever been in one of those situations where somebody just is ready to fix your problems and I'm just like, I don't need you to fix it. I just need you to listen. I need to be heard. James was telling us this. Does any of this sound familiar or is it just me? I hope you think, see, it's not just you. It's all of us. We have this problem. Personally, I am a great listener when it comes to counseling. I don't say that with pride. It's just um, I, I've been trained to do that in a counseling setting. If you talk to some of my family members, they would say, Mom, you're not a good listener, or Stan would uh, attest to that because I love a good debate. Don't you? <laughs> Maybe some of you do. I like to stir the pot and have a good debate and just you know, like feel those, just wrestle with ideas with somebody else. Uh, not everybody is like that, I guess. But, you know, the reason that we don't listen and we cut each other off and stuff like that, and why it's so important is because we need to be heard as people, don't we? I know I do. And, and often we'll pick those fights because we'll, we feel we have this need to be right. So we'll argue it to the death. Won't we, honey? <laughs> Talking to my, about myself. <laughs> and you know what? It's, it's really hard because, you know, it feels good for us to fix things, doesn't it? You know, it just makes me feel, oh, look, I did that. I helped that person so much. And it's so much easier to see the solution in somebody else's problems than it is to work on our own and fix ourselves. You know, you're not alone. We're all in this boat. That's why we need books like James that tell us to slow down and listen and don't get angry. Jesus had something to say about this in Matthew. Matthew was a disciple of Jesus, and he heard Jesus teach this. It's recorded for us in the book that he wrote, and after telling the crowd, Jesus was speaking to the crowd, Jesus went on to say, he told them, don't judge, because with whatever you judge with, you will be judged. And he went on to say this, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get that log out of your, rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will be able to see clear to help that other person to deal with a speck in your friend's eye. You know, this is the lesson that we need to learn, is before you try to fix others, you really gotta start by fixing you, okay? 
We're going to talk about that just a little bit. We all need fixing, so I'm not picking on anyone here. Simple enough. We can all go home right now, right? Fix you, everything will be fine, right? <laughs> Got it? Go home, go thou and do it. We need to look a little bit further at what James said. The last part is the toughest part, that slow to get angry. But you know, this is a very sobering verse because it's hard to keep anger in check when people push our buttons, disappoint, or even are abusive to us. But it says human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Sometimes we think it does. Sometimes we hope it does. Because we live in a world that is, you know, you need to remember this. We live in a world that is looking for a fight. They're not great listeners often. They are looking for a fight. We as Christians, we get sucked right into it, man. Boy, we are quick to get sucked right into it. And I think, I was thinking, why do we do this? Why do we do this as Christians? And I think it stems from this feeling that somehow we've arrived. You know, we've got the corner on the market of good and and we've arrived, and the world out there has all the real big problems. Their sins seem so much bigger than ours. And I think that we engage in these debates ignorantly sometimes, and you can see that on social media. And, and you'll probably have some people in your world that are really good at this. They love to go on and have their social media tirades about this, that, and the other. And it's not really that helpful. It creates more problems than it solves, church. It really does. You know, um, I've seen more people turned away from Jesus rather than towards him when this stuff goes on. It's very off-putting. And you may ask, yes, but aren't we supposed to fight the good fight of faith? If you read the rest of that passage, it's fight the good of fight, the fight of faith and lay hold of salvation. And you know what, and that's the key that we need to keep in mind always. Because, you know, I think of the religious group, if you've been in church while you've heard the word Pharisee, they were the religious leaders in Jesus' day, the keepers of the law. They were passionate about God's law to a certain extent. They failed in practice sometimes, and these religious leaders thought it was worth a good fight. In fact, they would bait Jesus looking for a fight. And one instance sticks in my mind is when they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery to Jesus, and they were hoping that he would, they were testing him and hoping he would give her a good talking to. And instead, he asked a question or made a comment, you who were without sin, cast the first stone, and one by one, those religious leaders quietly exited until just Jesus and the woman was left, and he saw the woman for who she was, a broken sinner in need of hope. He said, woman, go and sin no more. Jesus is our example when dealing with sinners. Sadly, as a church, sometimes we want to bar the door against the sinners and throw stones at them from the safety of our glass walls, and we have to be careful. Okay, we have to be careful because that's not what Jesus called us to do. If that's not enough to convince you to not get drawn into this trap of fighting your own personal holy war for your own personal um, high horse, off your own personal high horse, um, I want you to consider a bit of wisdom from Proverbs. Proverbs says this, don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. Now, what I want to point out here, I don't like using the word fool or foolish, but biblically, in a biblical sense, what that means is the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So uh, we're talking about godless people who do not acknowledge their creator. We have to see them as they are and not get drawn into foolish arguments. We need to look for ways to build a bridge and share truth in a loving and gentle way. I'm not saying we never engage or take a stand against sin, but we need to consider our own humanity. Sometimes we forget that part in the process and we look for God's opportunity. We need to engage slowly, cautiously, prayerfully, and with great humility, because if it isn't God's timing or directive, guess what? Your human anger, as James said, will not produce 
the righteous results that God desires. That's the simple truth. Just ask James who turned his focus, guess what, back on us. James had this to say. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. Too often we forget what we've been saved from. We've got to recognize our own brokenness and imperfection. We need to rely on the power of Christ to save and redeem because we can't do it. Humbly consider the needs of others realizing where they are on their spiritual journey. It's gonna be different from yours. Unless you have walked the exact same path as that person, you're on a different journey in your, as your faith grows into this living faith. Paul, the apostle, wrote this to the Roman church. Accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. We, he goes on to talk about certain days of the week and foods that they ate or didn't eat and stuff like that. And then he says, sums it up this way. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Or judgment seat of God, I'm sorry. When we stand before God, you know what? He's not gonna ask you about so-and-so. You can fill in that so-and-so blank with any name you want. He is not going to ask you about any communities or any interest focus groups or anything else. He's going to ask you about you. What did you do with my truth? How did you apply my truth to your life? And live out that faith. So when you're tempted to try to fix all the world's problems, realize you can't, okay? There's only one person that could do that. The best thing you can do with a broken world is share Jesus, okay? Not your dogma, or my dogma, or anybody's dogma. Dogma is looking for a fight. Jesus is the only one who can fix what's broken. We need to humbly take him to the world. And the principle we can take away from this in James is this. I'll tell you what it is. Listen, don't lecture. I want to make it simple for you so it can stick. Listen, don't lecture. Just say that. Listen, don't lecture. Listen, don't lecture. I'm saying that to myself. That takes humility, you know that? Treating others with respect and love, listening and trying to understand them and their point of view and their story, where they've come from. And it may mean setting aside some of our own freedoms sometimes. That is hard for me to say as an American. But I'm in, I've been in Australia a long time, so I'm kind of getting over it. <laughs> Living faith, here's our principle to take away. Living faith requires humility. Okay? If you're going to live out your faith and have it, that living, vibrant faith, it's going to require some humility. It also requires some hard work on our part. Did you know that? James wanted to make sure you knew that, so he said this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only for fooling yourselves. We're prone towards this self-deception. Did you know that? There's been a lot of work done on that. Uh, uh, EQ, that emotional intelligence, because, you know, often we lack self-awareness. Um, I've done a lot of studies in this in, in a cultural context, and we're so uh, prone to just be blind to even our own culture that we come from. Um, and then we gauge and compare ourselves with others, which is not a helpful practice, because what it does is it means we take our cues from the wrong source. It's like, well, so-and-so does that, I can do that, or so-and-so does that, I can do that. We need to look to God's word and see what it says and, and how God is applying it to our life at that time in our journey. So don't take your cues from the wrong sources. We're proud often because we think that we're further along than we are. Did you know that? Or maybe that was just me because it is my story. When I look back at my early days that were so full of Bible learning without a lot of understanding and application, I hadn't lived enough life for that yet. And I did a little math and just looking at, now I was saved as a child, but just looking at my adult years, <clears throat> that's 18 on, I did a little math. Any mathletes in here? I don't know if that's a term in Australia, but it was in America. Mathletes, you know, the, the ones that weren't good athletes, they were mathletes. Mm -hmm. I have one of those as a son. He just makes, blows my mind. I had to quit homeschooling him at 14 because his math exceeded mine. <laughs> And uh, so I did a little math, and this is a terrible equation, I'm sure it is, um, but if I took the number of adult years times um, 
52 weeks in a year, plus the unknown factor of all those extra bits that you can't always fit in to certain boxes, I came up with 7,696, give or take, sermons that I've listened to. Now, some of those would have been in a church service back in the day when the church did Sunday school, morning service, evening service, and a Wednesday service. You know, why the church has stopped doing that so much is one, people's lives got busy and different. There's a lot of ways to access content now. But also because, you know, good luck applying one sermon to your life in a week, let alone four. Think about that. And then you can add some others in. But also there's podcasts, and I listen to radio preachers almost every day when my kids were growing up. I tune them in on the radio. Um, Bible studies that I sat in on and conferences that I attended where there was a great speaker. And so, you know, I'm sure the number is quite higher than that 7,600 and some. And please don't figure out my age. I'll tell you it's 55, so you don't have to do that math. (laughs) So I got a ways to go yet, but um, that's sermons. Now, Bible reading is even a little bit more. When I think about doing a daily quiet time or daily devotions, and then I think about, you know, doing studies and read through the Bible, because I often do that in addition to my daily quiet time, and then sermon prep, there's a lot of reading that goes into that. That figure is 13,638 days, give or take, of Bible going into this person, okay? If I'm faithful every day, which sometimes I'm not, I'll let you know that. It's a lot, isn't it? A lot of learning, a lot of learning, or at least taking it in. That alone did not make me mature. It made me arrogant. Can I say that? Like a dog with a bone, thinking I had a corner on the truth and the group that I came from felt the same way, that we were the only ones going to heaven, I was ready to pick a fight and correct anybody that differed from me. Because, of course, I had, had it right. And we all tend to think that way. While my zeal and passion fueled evangelism and eventually mission in our world, I missed a key reality, and it's this thing that we all need to remember, listening and learning alone are not enough. We've got to do. James said, you must do what the word says. He says it this way. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself and then walk away and forget what you look like. A glance doesn't work because we glance at God's word We glance at God's word, we flee and forget. James wrote this almost 2,000 years ago and it's still so true today. The solution's pretty simple. He goes on to write, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. And it's so true when we apply God's word to our life, we do live a, it doesn't make all the problems go away, but it makes you know what you'd have to do in the problems. You remember that he will never leave you and forsake you and those things that are so important to our walk of faith. When we gaze and do what God's word says, then we grow. We have this living, thriving faith. That's what it looks like. Simon's holiday, remember that? I said I'd come back to that, is a good picture of how we should approach the word of God compared to a Richie holiday, the drive-by. They had their sleeves up. They jumped in. They got their hands in the dough. They learned something new. They had a go. They experienced it and applied it to their lives by eating that pizza. It was really good. And I bet that was the best tasting pizza they ever will eat because it was special. You know, that didn't happen. Their trip didn't just happen that way. It took good planning, but it also took action. Those tickets didn't book themselves. They had to make a plan. That's why Simon looked so tired because he was trying to plan so hard to get us sorted here and plan that trip. And uh, he was one tired guy. I hope he comes back refreshed. But we need to approach God's word with that sincere desire to experience his life, the life he has for us to its fullest. Have a plan for your spiritual growth. Take action, put it to the test, put God's word in and try it. Be disciplined and gaze, not glance and forget. Sometimes we think we know what God's word says, but the more we study it, the more alive and apparent it becomes. And there's tools out there to help us understand some of the difficult things in scripture that seemingly contradict each other, but they don't. It all has to be held in tension and not cherry-picked like Pastor Stan challenges to a few, several weeks ago. 
Living faith requires active obedience, putting it into action. You've got to do the word of God, put it into practice. Jesus said it this way, and I'm going to read it to you straight from the pages of Scripture, just so, because I like to do that sometimes. But I've got a little snippet of it for you. Jesus said this in Matthew, and it's repeated in Luke. So all the online notes are, have a mistake that, my apologies, because the passages were so close to identical, I kept bouncing back and forth between the two. But I'm reading to you from Matthew today. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock, though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse. It will not. It won't collapse. <laughs> it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand when the rains and floods come and the winds, I'm going to insert, of life blow and beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus said, we must follow the teaching to be wise. God word, God's word acts as that mirror to our soul. It cuts down to the quick. It's living and it's powerful and it cuts right down to the quick of the problems of our life. It reveals to us where we need to change because we see it, it's like, oh, the word says I'm not supposed to gossip. Ooh, that's a hard one. It's so important for us to read it, to seek to understand it, to hide it in our hearts and trust that it is true and that God's spirit will reveal that truth to us at just the right time. Have you ever read a verse 50 times and then the 51st time you read it, it's like, whoa, it just hits you? That's God's spirit at work using the word. If you want to be wise and fruitful as Christians, that's what it takes. Before James ends this passage, he reemphasizes one of his key points in a powerful way. We'll see him drive this home in two weeks when Pastor Stan uh, tackles James chapter three. But he said this several times, and when you see this kind of repetition in something, it, it should draw your attention because it indicates there's a problem that's pretty common and something we ne really need to tackle. And it says this, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, I'm having trouble controlling mine, you are fooling yourselves and your religion is worthless. That's pretty hard language, isn't it? Worthless? What we say really does matter. Our words matter. We had a little bit of a joke in the vision room before the service, and all of this is resonating through my, be slow to speak and quick to listen, but they were having fun and we had a good laugh. But what we say matters. You know why Jesus said it matters? Look at this verse. What you say flows from what's in your heart. I've re heard it read, and it might be another, I should have looked it up, but from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks is another way that's said. Watch out how you joke and things like that. And I'm not picking on those guys. That was all fine. But sometimes we'll have racist or off-color humor and things like that. Or we say things so carelessly and it flows from what's in our heart. Be careful what you're letting people see or clean up that heart. Okay? James doesn't want the reader to be left without, with worthless religion. We don't even like to use the word religion around this place because what it tends to mean, it's, it's this empty, go through the motions, yay, I showed up on Sunday, tick, I got my gold star for that, without owning it and living it in our day-to-day -day life. We call it rituals. We go through the rituals, that religious ritual. That's what the Pharisees did. I prefer to call myself a follower of Jesus. But we'll stick with James' language to these early Jewish believers as he thumb, sums things up. He said this, pure religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. One final principle for us to take home is living faith requires us to get involved to care about the world around us. That's what we are talking about as a church and our mission as we focus on the bridge, it's what we do overseas. Um, shout outs to Lisa and Jackie and Peter and Guinea and Phil and Carol Short and the Loftuses who represent us over in some challenging places taking the gospel of Christ or motivated by the gospel of Christ. Our world, though, you know, is on about causes. 
There are so many agendas out there, and most of them are driven by self-interest. I'm sure that's not a surprise to you. Because if God's not at the center of your world, you know who is? You. Reality. They like to preach at us about our need to be woke. You familiar with that term? It's not a compliment. Not, not for us. It's usually saying that, you know, they tell us we need to wake up or be woke. Our politicians say it. Our self-interest groups say it. The media says it. It preaches it at us in every video and movie and piece of music you listen to this day because it's popular. We see it streaming on social media. And there's probably billboards about it out there. And it's a little bit sickening. Doesn't it make you feel a little bit sick sometimes? Because the, apparently the one group that you're allowed to absolutely bash and hate are Christians. <laughs> Don't worry, Jesus said it was going to be like that. <laughs> but James challenges us to get involved and do care about the needs of those that are doing a tough care. But I want to challenge you with this. Stay awake and aware of the needs around us, not woke. Okay, and I'm talking mostly to you young people because you're getting a whole nose full of it. You've grown up in that to the, to the extent that you don't know anything different. But to us older folk, we're just trying to keep up and like, what is happening to our world? Can I just encourage you? I can encourage my mother this way all the time. Mom, this has been going on since the dawn of time, since the fall of man, no new sin under the sun. It's in there, it's through the pages of history and scripture. And we're just more aware of it because of technology today. To summarize this, your take homes today, if you want living faith, and I hope that you do, it requires three things, humility, at least three things, active obedience to God's word and time in that, putting it into practice so that we can grow. And then living faith requires involvement as we care for others without being corrupted by the world around us. You can care without being corrupted and you can care um, without being angry and dogmatic about things. Because what the world needs is Jesus, and God so loved the world that he sent Christ to die for our sins, and while we were yet sinners, he did that. We can't bar the doors of the church. We must be ready to receive those who are different and share in this journey of faith together. Let me ask you a question, if, you, if I have your permission to do so. Do you want a living faith, a living and growing faith? Simple yes or no question. You can answer that for yourselves. If yes, then I got a couple more questions for you. What are you doing about it? James said we must be doers. Do you know Jesus? That's where it starts. You need to know Jesus first as your own personal savior. If you know him, are you following his teaching? Do you know what his teaching is? Have you been in the word? It's what leads to wisdom. I hope so. I hope so. Are you using your ears and mouth proportionately? That's an easy one. God made it really easy for us. You got two of these, one of these. Use them proportionately. What does your speech and your human interactions, what are you contributing to those difficult relationships? What do they reveal about what's in your heart? Now, are you having trouble with anger? Have you been making excuses as to why you're grumpy and letting everyone else know about it? James told us we need to be slow to anger, slow to get angry. Maybe you're more concerned about how others are living their lives and wanting to fix them rather than looking in the mirror of God's word and letting it do its work on your life first. Have you brought are bought into the world's woke agendas. Be careful. I just want to encourage you to be careful. Because what might, what might you need to change in your life in order to feed and fuel what pleases God, I want you to, to remember that garbage in is garbage out. What does God's consuming content that God produces, what kind of impact can that have on your life rather than all the social media stuff? Be sure you're consuming the right God's agenda content for a life of vibrant living faith. Is it okay if I pray for us? It's a lot to have taken, isn't it? Let me just pray for us before we close. 
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are such a good and loving and patient and generous and gracious God. We thank you that you loved us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, help us to take on board your word and the things that you teach us so that this world can be a better place because we can build bridges to a lost and dying world. Father, they need you and that's what what we need to remember. And we need you. Father, help us to live out the truth from your word. Thank you for being patient with us. Father, help us to be patient with one another because at the end of the day, we just want your Holy Spirit to rule and reign. We want King Jesus on the throne, Father, and we want to bring you glory. May it be so this day. In Christ's name we pray, amen.